Yeah, I... Okay, David. David, you want to record also? David, you can go ahead and record. Yep. Okay. And it's your turn to start. David or me? David, <laughs> David's supposed to start. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Celebrate the Arts, brought to you by Florida Artists Group, also known as FLAG. FLAG is proudly celebrating our 72nd annual exhibition and symposium. My name is David Chang, and I'm the chair of FLAG Area One. Um, and it is my great pleasure today to introduce this particular session um, by a, a celebrated artist and also a professor emeritus in drawing and painting from University of North Florida and Paul Latnier. And Paul is going to show us some secrets in <laughs> landscape painting, particularly some advice on plein air painting. And this presentation is being recorded as you know, and for later publication and public access. And so we request that you remain muted throughout. But if you do have a question during the session, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. And Paul then will know sure. to answer. Otherwise, everybody's muted. So welcome. Thank Here's you. Paul. Uh, appreciate you guys uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm in my what's called the Cork Arts District Studio Complex, so uh, I'm going to try to play like I'm doing a plein air painting today, although uh, it's storming outside, so I'm, I'm inside. But what I thought I would do is um, kind of explain my, my palette a little bit and my approach, even when I'm doing a, a plein air painting. I'm working on a 16 by 20 today, uh, and I understand the presentation is about an hour, and um, I paint rather quickly, but um, hopefully I'll cover all the bases. And as David said, uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Um, what I'd like to do right now is I'm gonna just flip this around a little bit and down, I've only got the one camera, but I wanted to show you uh, my palette and it looks like a big messy palette and it probably is but it's in a very logical arrangement and that palette arrangement I've been using for um, almost 40 years or 50 years with, with some minor variations in what I do with the palette. I call it my basic palette and I always start off with the basic colors that is red, yellow and blue and then white and maybe black and then I call it plus one or plus two and usually that's uh, a pigment or a color that I pick up uh, if I need something special to get some atmosphere or some edges or a little bright spot here and there. And um, it may be sometimes it may be something like a bright orange or it may be a violet or it may be a particular green or something. Most of the time I make my own greens, I make my own secondary colors, so I don't go into the uh, the purples, the oranges too much, unless I just put them down when I start painting. Today, I've actually laid out a pretty full palette because uh, the way I paint, uh, I never know when I'm going to need a certain color or a certain value. Although sometimes I'll lay out a palette and I'll only use three or four colors and the rest of them kind of just sit there and I scrape them off and go to the next painting. I do believe in one thing when I'm plein air painting. I don't really like to waste time when I go outdoors. I know the light's gonna change. I know the, 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 the weather's going to change. Uh, it goes from hot to, to freezing sometimes, or it goes from bright and sunny to storms. So I attempt to go directly to the solution. And so um, like all, most artists, I tend to block everything in, then go for the large shapes and then refine it, refine it, refine it on down. I'm gonna turn the camera around and show you the panel that I'm working on uh, today. I have made a few marks on it because I knew I wouldn't have much time. And because um, the camera is almost in front of the uh, panel, 
I'm painting off to the side. So hopefully I won't make too many mistakes as I get this thing going. One of the things I like to do um, is I think generally composition is front and center uh, in a composition. And if you've looked at uh, Edgar Payne's uh, book on composition, uh, landscape painting and stuff, there's a lot of diagrams where he just divides and other artists too into either the golden means, the Fibonacci spiral, or just the rule of thirds. I'm kind of developing this painting around the rule of thirds in that I'm gonna put a little focal point right up here. There's gonna be some big stuff in the foreground and a couple of little things that kind of lead your eye into the painting and walk you back a little bit. And as I paint, um, I'll try to talk a, a little bit of about uh, some of the specific things that I'm going for, but generally um, I start, I mix up a really large batch of gray and always try to go in and uh, generally put my darks in first, concentrating a little bit on working from uh, cool shadows and uh, generally a warm light source. I find that kind of works for me. And I um, also strive for a lot of contrast. And I think the contrast thing is what draws the eye into a painting. It's, it's, it's that old value thing. I know when I teach normally in my classes and all, uh, I tend to say warm highlights and cool shadows. And so the other thing I like to try and do is go directly to the, sol the uh, solution. And so I keep those darks relatively dark, knowing that, that I can lighten up some of the darks. I can um, punch some things in with the, uh, with the lights and the brights. And so I try to just set up a pattern. I also go for, you might see, for example, I'm going to do a, something rather quick here. And I infuse a lot of color into the painting, knowing that I'm probably going to knock it down in value, but I want to set up my value scale for the sky. And that kind of just gives me a starting point for just about everything. And once I, once I kind of get that big mass of things in there, uh, it allows me to start uh, fusing colors into uh, the paint. And I'm just gonna make a couple of marks here where eventually I'm gonna have my, my focal point somewhere in here. And that gives me a, a bright, plus it also starts to set up my contrast. And I'll put a few more little things in there along the way. And when I'm mixing large batches, I know that I'm gonna have uh, large passages of bright colors. And I don't really get into any detail when I'm just starting a painting. I uh, focus mostly on just trying to get um, a, a descriptive pattern going. And sounds kind of funny, but I look 
for the painting to start talking to me a little bit. Once that starts happening, then I know I'm sort of on track and I can get something going. And one of the things I, I also do, is that I also tell students is I approximate a lot of stuff. I don't really fight with myself too much on getting the exact color down. All I care is that I get a shape that's legible and a shape that reads. What inspired me about this little scene is uh, it's near San Fidelli. I was doing a workshop in San Fidelli uh, before COVID. And it was just this wonderful, wonderful place to paint. But one of the places I went, there was a, um, an old rock wall. And um, that rock wall, it looked like someone had driven a car through this wall right here. And I thought, man, I'd love to paint that. And at the time, I didn't have that much time because I was in a, you know, teaching a workshop and but I took some good reference photographs and I'm going to improvise a, a little bit today as well not go with all the detail and again since this is kind of a little bit of flying by the seat of my pants in terms of time um, if I have to make some changes I can make some changes and hopefully if nothing else you'll see kind of the direction it's going but hopefully you can start to see big patterns uh, coming together and uh, have to deal some with uh, atmosphere, of course. And like any other scene, if we really want to push that background back, we've got to lighten things up and cool some things down. Sometimes I'll overlap those shapes, other times I'll just let them stay. And what I figure I'll do sometimes even is uh, when I'm infusing other colors, like the need to uh, lighten that horizon a little bit, I'm just infusing some Naples yellow uh, into that blue that I put down earlier. And that'll give me some contrast in that little mountain. And then I won't go in here and smooth everything else out. I kind of like to keep that painterly quality going as long as I can. And uh, plus, I don't really have the patience to, to finish a, a high degree of, of finished. I just had a visitor this morning who came in, teaches uh, at the New York Academy, I think. And, you know, I was looking at the high degree of, of finish that they have in their work. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I probably wouldn't be a good fit for that school. Although I had a career as an illustrator. And so as an illustrator, I learned to work rather quickly. Um, had to deal with a lot of deadlines. And I, I find also that for people who do illustration, that it really is a, a jumping off point for painting and myself included, most of us who are into uh, 
illustration tend to want to get out of it pretty soon and your eyesight starts going and uh, I just wanted personally just to kind of get a lot looser than my um, illustrative kind of painting that I was doing as, as an illustrator. And of course we realize we go from general to specific, that is the, the large general shapes down to the really small little specific shapes. and start getting into little nuances of things. And then I'll start to pick up on the grays. And, The other thing that I do when I'm playing our pain, I mean, literally the first thing I start to do is look at where my light is coming from. And that way, that's why I laid in all these dark shadows here because that establishes uh, my light direction. And uh, when you link all those shadows together, it tends to, act as a catalyst that sort of holds the painting together. And I don't like little plein air paintings that are overly rendered. I prefer them to look like paintings. And to me, there are a lot of qualities that go into a painting. I mean, of course, we look at it from, you know, what does it say, the visual impact of the painting. And then maybe you look at the technical aspects of how well it's done. Uh, is it done with conviction? Um, does it show uh, a level of skill in mark making? Because that's really all this is. I'm just making marks and um, hoping these marks will kind of come together. One of the things that drew me uh, to this uh, little landscape motif here is there were golden rods everywhere and um I thought, wow man that, that is just beautiful those little golden rods so i'm planning to add a little bit of a golden rod motif to this and what i'll be doing along the way is breaking up some of these greens And just even infusing a lot of uh, various colors in those greens, just to establish a f basically a foreground and a middle ground. And of course that distant background back there. And right now just kind of looking for some variations in value, little things that, and of course I'm even, even here, it would be like painting outside, I'm still squinting my eyes um, to try and separate all the big simple shapes. And I deliberately let that uh, underpainting come through. And the reason I started off with a, a toned underpainting was it eliminates all the, the little uh, tic-tacs and doodads in the, uh, in the surface of the canvas.
one of the things I'm guilty of is I get so into the painting sometimes that I don't step back enough and I'm probably not going to be stepping back to really look at this. One of the things that happens if you look at, uh, read John Carlson's book, um, the sky is your brightest light source in a plein air painting. All the flat planes that face the sky are the second value range. The diagonals, like maybe in these mountains, uh, they tend to be in the third value range. Oops. And uh, these dark darks are usually the verticals of trees or bushes. And those verticals uh, are the darkest aspects. And the things underneath some of those verticals are the darkest things that end up being in the painting and back in the shadows. But again, I like that personally because it establishes um, that um, contrast. And I don't know if it'll come out in this that much today, but I compose with value and I compose with color and I compose with edges. And I think they all play a role in a painting. It's just, you have to decide that everything can't be an attention getter. So you kind of have to prioritize what you want to get attention. My attempt right now is to establish this as a, as a point of entry. And there's a pathway that will go behind this pile of rocks, which doesn't look like a pile of rocks yet. And basically it's gonna take you pretty much out of the picture, except compositionally, the rocks will probably go up above the sidewalk. But because the sidewalk is gonna be the brightest bright in the foreground, I'm going to, what I hope, kick the eye up to this area right in here, which hopefully will pick up some of the brights down here and automatically take your eye into this distant villa here. And I wrestle with, because I'm improvising as I go here, a couple of different things. And that is, um, you know, I could go in there and put another villa or a little farm in there. And if I have time, I might. There are some things that are typically uh, Italy that just simply read Italy. And, uh, you know, I could include those in there, but I'm hoping that we'll just have this large block in. And this warm reflected light now, hopefully I'm infusing a little bit of warmth down there in that shadow, reflected light coming back from this sidewalk or this uh, little road or path back here. So I haven't got to a point where I'm doing the, the rocks yet. I'll define all that, the broken rocks and all that stuff. And, uh, several large pathways in here that I like. And by the way, I tend to talk to myself. So um, maybe while I'm talking to you, I'm really talking to myself. I guess you can hear me, right? Everybody can hear me okay. And uh,
And once you've blocked in a painting, then it tends to start talking to you. And one little mark begats another mark. And I think that's what's exciting about plein air painting and about painting in general is start with a plan, but not a plan that's so complex that you can't change as you go and, and kind of improvise your way along. And I also think that, that in, a, in a plein air painting, there's a freshness. You want to look like, um, at least I think, a painting, a plein air painting, should not be rendered. It should look like you, you're driving past it at 25 miles an hour, and there's just enough information to kind of uh, whet your appetite and say, oh, did you see that house? And, or did you see that cow? Or did you see that bird? Or something like that. And you turn, and just for a moment, you get a glimpse of it, but all you need is a glimpse. I like to keep the outer edges loose and abstract and actually get a little tighter and a little tighter as I get into uh, the subject matter. Sometimes I like it at the stage it's at right now. Um, I'll do a lot of demonstrations in my classes and the students usually comment and they'll say, I really wanted you to, to just stop 20 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago. I go, oh, well, next time. back into the sky. And the other thing that I suggest too, is work the entire painting. You know, you can't, you're not gonna see any progress in your painting if you get caught up in one area. And I see that a lot in students and they, they will get caught up in one area and they wonder why they don't finish the painting. And mostly it's because their rhythm is off. I mean, it's all about the rhythm. And even in a little painting like this, if I break my rhythm, this painting will have a whole different personality and I'm not sure I like it. I, it's, some things are happening now that are starting to make me kind of happy and we'll see how it goes. But it is an impression. And as an impression, um, I call it shorthand. It's a brief statement of a precise moment in time captured in what I hope will not be the blinking of an eye, but not worked on so much that you get caught up in the skill of the artist rather than the, the piece itself. I'd rather someone look at this and say, uh, I saw a place in Montepulciano that looked just like that. And uh, if they do that, there's a good chance that They'll like it enough to maybe buy it. I'm working on several uh, large commissions. And one is a, a painting of Italy and the client wanted, wanted sunflowers, olive trees, a villa and uh, grapevines, vineyards. But the good news, it's a, about a six foot painting. So, it's going to have sunflowers and grapevines and uh, 
Olive trees. Also in a plein air painting, I go out now, I do like to try to do a painting in one sitting. However, that doesn't always work out. In an ideal world, it does. But I also like to say that in the time that I spent on the painting, if the weather changes or I get a call to come home or something, I've got enough information along with some reference photos that I could in fact go home and finish it up with a few touches. I used to do a lot more plein air events than I do now. And so many times people think that a plein air event, that it's all about that uh, one painting on the spot. But most of the good, really good plein air painters that I know, they take them back to their hotel at night and uh, they tweak on them a little bit. They don't want to present a bad painting and, and you know, the guts of the painting may be done during the plein air experience. And I probably spend a little extra time also trying to make something happen. I've got a plan obviously in place. I actually did a, a black and white little compositional thing. And so basically this is a notion in my head based upon a drawing and a place I've been. I'm also kind of a, a lazy painter. I'm productive. I, I do a lot of, lot of painting, but as you can see, I, uh, I'll use this one brush as long as I can. And once I have everything blocked in with a reasonable size brush, then I can go back with a smaller brush and refined. And when I get this along the way, I'll go back and do what I call dusting. Sergeant did that with his paintings. Sergeant would really block in a painting very quickly. And um, Rembrandt, so I understand, did a little of it as well. And um, that kind of pulls it together. There may be areas, there may be edges here and there that just aren't communicating. And when that happens, you got to do something. Either you have to diffuse it or emphasize it or de-emphasize it. And I love uh, to be able to just spread the color around. Um, this is what I call a, a throw behind this mountain. Ideally, I don't know if I'll have time to, to get it up to the point where I want it. 
got some shadow issues going on here with my warms and cools and things. But when an object, say like the mountain or a vineyard back here, if it peeks out on the other side of an object, the notion is that it gets your eye to move around the object. Also, when you have a strong diagonal or strong something leading you out, it's always a good idea to put something in the road that will kind of block that movement to stop your eye from just shooting right out of the picture and force your eye to come back into um, where, where you want to direct the, the, the uh, focus. And a lot of times, for example, uh, a red roof. Sometimes when I'm painting, I will deliberately overstate something just to see how it's going to balance out, knowing that I'm going to go back in there eventually and change it. Sometimes it's a little bit like making mud pies. You start off with some mud. And you start pushing it around, draw a smiley face in it. And uh, little things start to happen. I'm uh, indicating these clouds because a lot of times in a demonstration, I'll do a, a very a, a quick demonstration and I won't get into clouds. And I'll say, well, what if it had clouds? So um, someone always wants to see clouds in a painting. I, I think because they think they're, they're difficult and they're not the easiest things to paint. But uh, the other thing that I suggest and, and I do is when I'm setting up my palette, first laying it out, I read somewhere that Sargent, when he set up his palette, he put enough paint down to do 10 paintings, even though he didn't use the paint. And that's the one thing that I say, put down enough paint so that you don't have to go back to your paint box and get more paint. This is a little weird because I do feel like I'm talking to myself <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yes, I am. Normally in a class, you hear someone, you go, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, okay. And sometimes I can ask, you know, am I doing okay? Is this thing working? What do I need to do? You're doing beautifully. Ah, <laughs> thank you. That helps to know. That gray, I mixed a, I don't think I mentioned it, but I mixed a huge batch of middle tone gray, a number, maybe a four or five. And eventually I'll infuse that gray because the world is kind of gray, especially when you paint it. I mean, it's a, it's a happy place and it's not great, but when you're painting it, it really is dominated by the grays. And what you do is put the bright colors where you want the viewer's eye to go. 
and uh, the other thing I, I noticed that, and I, I, I talk like, um, I know I'm talking to a group of professionals today, but I get, students that are afraid to make marks and they're afraid they never put enough paint down and it really takes time to um, to go back lay out your palette again and the other thing i suggest uh, you can't see it, but I keep a rag in my hand and I constantly am constantly squeegeeing uh, that rag off. Because what happens is oops, your brush, if you keep squeegeeing it off, the paint, when you dip into your paint, it doesn't go all the way up into the ferrule and the bristles necessarily. It, uh, especially when you're, when you're picking up paint and you're kind of laying it down. The other thing is um, a lot of the painting is, is about just laying the paint down over other paint. I, and I personally kind of gravitate towards that because it, it gives you texture. And uh, sometimes that texture will actually allow a form to kind of read. Plus, d depending on the direction of the brush stroke, it can read. Um, the texture can just read as part of the design and not, I don't like to be obvious on the brush strokes that they get so large and unwielding that uh, they distract from the rest of the painting. And I don't even like in the middle of a painting having to go back and clean my palette even. And that, that's basically the reason I keep that palette laid out very simply and the same way every, every time I paint. Oops.
got a little brush hair right there. I don't know where that thing came from, but it's annoying. Okay, now those sunflowers are bright. Really, really bright. And I want them to be part of the composition, but I want you, the viewer to be able to see them as well. So I'm gonna start just making some marks where I think I'd like for them to be. Those golden rods. And sometimes you put them in and sometimes they contribute to the composition. Other times you put them in and they, they get a little distracting. So what I call that when I do that is a kind of a romantic notion. I've got this notion about these uh, golden rods. And you want to be careful that you don't overdo them. And so I don't, I don't just lay them all in at once. I'll put in a few just to get a read on it. I notice I keep hitting the tripod too, I'm sorry. I'm guessing it probably looks like an earthquake on your end. I'm not a, a big user of black. Normally I make my own, but I keep a, a pile of uh, called um, ivory. Um, hmm, now I can't think of it. Made by Utrecht. I'll get it. I'll, I'll think of it before I quit here. And um, it's kind of a transparent black. You can mix it with transparent colors. And it's pungent when you really need a dark. Most of the time I just mix it with another color though. So it's not screaming that it's, that I'm necessarily using black. I think I'm doing the same thing I do when I do a demo in my classes. I get into it and I actually forget there are people watching. And uh, I just get into the zone. And once I'm in that zone, and I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be at least giving a lesson, well, not a lesson, demonstration, Okay, in these open shadows, the sky reflects. So they can be opened up a little bit with some cool blue from the sky. And generally I opt for either dark or light uh, when I'm trying to separate two objects. 
and, and so your choice is you can separate color with color like those uh, golden rods but you can also we could really make these pop by putting a dark against them i'm not sure i'll have uh, time enough to do that today but uh, hopefully you can kind of see How are we doing on time? You have about nine minutes. Really? Yeah. And it's over? And it's over. <laughs> I was just starting to have fun. <laughs> Anybody that has any questions, please ask him. I'm sure he Oh, has please, yeah. Yeah, this thing, uh, you know, I guess in, in an hour, you can see how far along you can take a painting and get it going. And I usually on a plein air piece, it's usually done in two hours. I rarely spend more than um, two hours or so on a painting. And uh, if it's not done, then it probably wasn't a very good painting. And I'm at a point now where I could take this little painting and start pulling it together. I, I had no idea we were that close to, to the finish, but I guess that's good news and bad news. But yeah, if anyone has any questions or wanna ask me anything, please go ahead. I can, if, if this doesn't work, I can blame it on the interruptions. God, they asked me so many questions and I'm just. Never really resolved my little pathway there but pause what what's going right in front of there in the foreground coming towards the front of the picture here or uh, here? Up, up a little further right in, yeah right in there yeah that that is where there's a little trail and it goes behind this wall oh this is a wall well, this is There's a wall, no wall here in the foreground. You may have to back up to see that. I'm I'm sorry if I have to say play like there's a wall there. But um, again, now comes a time of just refinement. And um, I'll show you. I'm glad you asked that because that was there's not enough separation between that that path that goes back here and that's my next thing to let these rocks overlap that and remember i said you put things in front of other things and then you separate it with light and dark and um I probably, again, this is one of the things where I really haven't stepped back to see what I've got here. But I think in terms of just the demonstration, this gives you an idea of a general approach. And
Who knows, I may even go back and finish it one day. So were you dragging your brush across those colorful areas to make break it up into branches or suggestions? Yeah, yeah, just just uh, just to indicate. You know, one of the things the, the beauty of, of plein air painting is your this whole surface is wet. So I can go in there and scrape. I could scrape it out with my palette knife or um, go in there with the handle of my brush. Mm -hmm. I do that with figures a lot. If you look at some of Rembrandt's portraits, boy, that handle, that brush handle plays a huge role in his paintings where he, he doesn't go into a lot of detail, uh, but in those wet areas, it, when he's wanting to uh, paint, hair he just scratches right into the surface of the painting back of this wall obviously if it wasn't reading as a wall then it it needs some work but what i would do is go in here and at least indicate see some warm bricks or something in there and put a few angles so that it starts to maybe read. Paul, there's a, a question in the chat. Uh, Jesse wants to know what's your preferred surface to paint on for plain air stretch canvas or panels? Well, as a matter of convenience, I use panels. This, this is a stretch canvas today. Um, and as long as they're kind of a small size, I mean, the, the, the notion about plein air painting, especially when I was doing a lot more on the circuit and stuff, um, it was a matter of convenience because all my frames were either uh, eight by 10, nine by 12, 11 by 14, 12, 16, 16 by 20, everything was standard. That way I could order um, my frames ahead of time. And I carry, when I was really uh, out on the, what I call the trail and participating a lot more than I do now, I have an entire framing kit that's in one box and I can uh, frame and put hangers on a painting and especially the, uh, the quick draws. I participate in a lot of quick draws and the quick draws, the some of you, I'm sure we've got some plein air painters here, but in the quick draws, they uh, blow the whistle and you have to stop. And then the next thing you do is go and put your painting in a frame and get it ready for judging. And again, I don't like wasting time. So I kind of come prepared. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've got, but remember originally I laid in these brights right here. Well, the, what I'm going to do now is push them back. I'm going to cool them down because they're, they're too bright. I do that as, as I was saying, because it kind of a shorthand. And they were getting way too much attention. And at this point, I think painting now, it's about uh, refinement. Refine, refine, refine. I'm at the stage an hour into the painting where I should probably now just step back, study it, take a little break. Um, 
kind of like stepping back, smell the roses a little bit. And uh, see what I need to do. See, I was going to put a But I work the whole painting. When I've got a gray on my brush, for example, and I know there, there are other areas where I might use that gray. You're probably thinking, yeah, how about on those rocks on that wall? And I'd agree with you. Mm, boy, those little flowers are kind of cheesy, aren't they? <laughs> That's what I mean. You try it. It doesn't work. When in doubt, take it out. If I caution lives. I'm guessing I'm almost done, huh? I mean, I know my session is almost done. I know the painting <laughs> is not done. Those last few strokes just made a huge difference. Oh, there? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, sometimes it's just a little mark like that, and it changes. It kind of pushes things back and pushes it in from this side, and it needed a little of that. Yeah, it sort uh, of activated that space. Yeah. that little flat pass behind there. Yeah, that's helping to bring that green field into the left-hand side of the painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and it's just little stuff like that. I really hate for you to have to stop. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I'm kind of there too, <laughs> but uh, you tell me, I, this is, I, I hope it's been helpful. Definitely, definitely. Uh, absolutely. We could also leave a few minutes if anybody has questions, right? Yeah, definitely. If anybody has questions. In fact, there's, um, it's, there's a question, what's your preferred medium to use? Oh, it's oil. oil. I, I'm an oil, oil painter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I teach a figure drawing and a studio painting class every week. And even in the figure class, we rotate uh, one month we draw and the next month we paint and it's all oil paint. And um, And these are classes uh, from your studio, right? Oh, yeah. In the, I'm in what I call the, the teaching studio right now. My studio is next door. And this old warehouse is over 100 years old. And my studio, the warehouse was built around my studio. My studio was the upholstery room uh, for a furniture company. And um, they wanted to remodel it and make it 
pretty. And I said, I don't want it remodeled. I want to, I want the, there's old wood and it is kind of dusty, but you know, I don't have to worry about messing up white walls and Couple of things. Man, you're a good audience, no question. Well, I, I, I see that uh, we can go a little bit longer from what our, our host, Community Foundation for Brevard says. We can go until about um, another half an hour, 50, 25 minutes if you want to. So uh, um, I'm game if everybody else is. All I'm doing, I'll just continue to tweak on this thing. And uh, now you're throwing the gauntlet down for me, though. Well, no, you don't have to finish, uh, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just mesmerizing seeing what you're doing. Um, do you have a preferred brush? I see you tend to use flats. Um, I do f use flats. And, you know, I could say, like, oh, popular artists I love rosemary brushes and I, I'm very good friends with them and I do use their brushes but I also my whole thing is brushes are made to be used and I've got a lot of dear friend artists they spend more time cleaning their brushes and wrapping them in paper and truthfully I throw them away or relegate them to another cause you know I've only used two brushes in this yeah. painting so uh, I don't think, I know it makes your head feel good to use the really great expensive stuff, but I don't think it's really necessary. To me, it's kind of like having uh, boat shoes. When you wear them out, you relegate them to another cause and you go get a new pair. and they become your uh, garden shoes. That'd be some light peeking through there. Paul, oh, I keep looking at that clean long sleeve shirt with no paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> I did this especially for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a messy painter. I, I'm really messy. But today I knew I'd only be painting an hour and I, <laughs> I, I have aprons and I am the painting rag sometimes. I really am. And, no. I'm that makes me soft. feel a little better. Yeah. Let's see if I can get some little things in there. Well, the other part of this equation too is that ordinarily, I would take a break about now. <laughs> <laughs> a shot of espresso would help. I've got it in the other room. <laughs> I could certainly look at my reference for a building, but right now I'm just faking it a few things to see how it's going to work. And uh, whoop, that's an awfully rough color there. So I guess I'll be able to see a, a video of this. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I appreciate that. You guys do an amazing job.
I'm not sure I want to, but. This is um, what I talked about when I'm just dusting things now where there are hard edges all over the place and starting uh, to really refine some things that are in there. Just little, kind of little nuggets here and there that may cause it to pop. Or, And what I would do is start to develop this area right around in here a little bit. And uh, and the marks will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Paul, do you use rosemary mopper brush? I see your portraits in the background. Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of a old fashioned painter. You know, I started with Utrecht brushes 60 years ago or so and <laughs> Utrecht paints. And while I love Rembrandt and gambling and all that, I kind of, I mean, I, you know, I know whether it's a flat or a filbert or a, a, a detailed brush or a soft hair. I prefer the long haired hog hair bristle brushes because I can really shovel more paint down with them and, and pick up more paint too. But uh, for blending, I love my sables and soft brushes especially in the portraits and things, when you get into some, some blending. And this is where I start to really pick up a lot more paint and uh, where the texture in here, you can see that can contribute to that wall. Needs a lot more work than I'm putting into it, but that would be the next direction. So there's a lot of brush, a lot of paint on this brush. And one of the things that have, I mean, the downside of painting rather quickly and with a lot of paint, of course, is that you have to just keep laying the paint on top of paint. And 
you, you have to be pretty careful. It's easy, quite easy to get mud. And however, I, I don't object. One person's mud is another person's color, so. There's another question. Um, uh, okay. Do you, do you know what? Do you know when you're getting tired? Uh, right now. Is, <laughs> right now is is some is there something to signal a break for you? Uh, well, the natural break is about an hour into the painting. I mean, I I really do need to step back and look at this. Yeah. And I'm too close to it, but I'm doing it just for the sake of the demonstration. Um, you know, and I'm, and that, that's okay, but uh, there, there are several directions I could take this now. Um, to me, it's, a, it's too bright. It's a, a little on the garish side, but I do that intentionally because I mark, what I call mark my territory as I go along. And then the rest of it is graying this thing down. And I mean, that would really mean, you know, graying this down, developing this, this path. I've got to put some, some sharp darks in front of that path to break that up and make it really kind of look like a, a wall. Um, but, you know, there's an old saying, a painting is not finished until the check clears the bank anyway. So... <laughs> <laughs> So this painting is not finished. <laughs> There's another question. I think this person may have come in after you had started the presentation. And uh -huh. they wanted to know something about more about your palette and your selection of limited colors. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I generally, there are two ways I approach a palette. Uh, if it's figurative work, it's a slight variation on the Zorn palette, which is simply black, white, a red and yellow ochre. And again, when I'm using the Zorn palette, I call it the Zorn palette plus one if I need uh, something to get a little bit better uh, skin tone. On a, my landscape plein air stuff, I start with red, yellow and blue, but uh, then I, am very selective about what the next colors are going to be. And if, for example, I'm going to paint a huge golf course, I'm going to probably get a tube of green out. And what I do when I paint straight out of the tube, the first thing I do is kill it with its complement. And uh, I demonstrate that in some of the classes, how you can take a red and devalue, uh, change the hue, uh, the, the, even the chroma of a green, or you can take a green and add red to it, and it makes a much more natural, earthy green. Um, I'll put a little, sometimes there is a little bit of violet in that sky, but, but not much. Uh, and then I would refine that. But the, the real answer is I start with red, yellow, blue, and then I don't necessarily add the secondary colors as much as uh, I let um, Robert Gamblin do all the work. And if he's got a beautiful Montserrat orange that I can use for a sunset, I'll pick up that Montserrat orange. Sometimes in the sky, I'll use a king's blue. The problem I have with king's blue is that when you use it, it's so obvious. It just screams out at you that you're using. It. So I will use king's blue, but I will really uh, change the the uh, power of that blue by adding a, a little orange to it, or another color, or even another blue. But it is kind of a go-to color when you're uh, when you're plein air painting though if you want a delicious sky and 
you want to sell that painting. Of course, all your artist friends will know it's King's Blue, but generally your audience won't know it. All they'll know is look at that gorgeous blue sky. And so I deliberately, um, I'll go through a cerulean blue stage where I mix my blues out of cerulean and, and cobalt may be my go-to blue because cobalt, you can mix it with anything. Alizarin crimson, it'll even mix with a cad red light, although it'll go kind of purple, but it'll give you a good gray if you need that kind of a gray. And so um, I would just say at the point where you sit down to do a plein air painting, um, think about the, your basic palette first, because with red, yellow, and blue, you can do a complete painting. I mean, you can, you can mix every color in the world. What you can't mix is the red, yellow, and the blue. But with those colors, you can mix your grays, you can mix uh, your blacks. Uh, a lot of times I'll use an alizarin crimson and phthalo green or viridian for a black. And uh, it's just a beautiful transparent black. And uh, so it, it, it really just kind of depends on the painting and how much time you have. But I don't, well, I mean, you know, you get my age, you don't want to waste your time. Paul, when you mentioned the Zorn's palette, did you mean Anders Zorn? Yeah, yeah. He was, the misconception is that that's all he used was his, that what is known as his Zorn palette. But if you really look at his works, he snuck a blue in there from time to time. But um, when I'm when I get new students in, we work on the Zorn palette before we go to a, a full palette or a limited palette. And the reason is they very quickly see that um, you know you can get an elegant painting with your red, your ochre, your black, and your white. I mean, it it it, it it's a timeless looking little painting. And I do demonstrations of them. And they get it. And a lot of times, once they get used to it, they really don't want to go to an advanced palette. But, you know, I feel an obligation to, to, to kind of show them and uh, expose them to it anyway. So, but for simplicity's sake, I really believe in keeping it as simple as possible. So anyway, do one more little thing just to see if it'll change some of the dynamics of this. And then I'm gonna probably go home. <laughs> <laughs> or next door to the espresso. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just put something down just to try it, see how it feels. Like that shadow going across that road probably needs to be darker, cooler. Yeah, I'm gonna probably, I'm gonna be picking on this if, if I don't. Call it a day. Nancy, this is a good idea. I love the fact that you're doing it. It, it brings me back to times when I was going out in plein air painting up in the mountains in, in Tennessee. Oh, yeah. But I also mean just the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, these, these meetings you're putting together, I think it's such a good idea. Well, we've gotten a lot of good comments, and I know that um, uh, by introducing it to some of the teachers in our public school system and 
um, universities that they're going to be benefiting from it too. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. So it won't be a one time thing. All right. Well, well I'm probably, um, I've punished this enough. <laughs> David, you want to wrap it up? Okay. I think uh, did Alex last question uh, got answered. Alex had a question. Have you done plein air monochromatic? Oh, sure. Um, it's a little almost when I do a nocturnal or something, it's a very, very limited palette two two pigments or something like that. And again, um, I don't want to say I was just showing off today, but I didn't want to get myself into a bind. So I loaded up that palette with a lot of paint. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's just the path I took today. And hopefully there's a little something there. If nothing else, you know, I, the, the composition is okay. The notion of the uh, sunflowers didn't quite work out the way I wanted to. But then again, I'm not through with it. I think there's something there that I'll probably chase until I get it right. But you've got the yeah. thought process of plein air painting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then, in, you know, time is of the essence when you're out in the field. So hopefully, you know, you get a sense of what it's like. If Absolutely. You don't do plein air. Those of us who are plein air painters, I mean, that's just what we deal with every single time. But I think it makes you a much better studio painter too. The, the several commissions I'm working on, they're six footers, but I start them off just like I would start off a little eight by 10 or 11 by 14. Big brushes, a lot of paint and simple shapes and, and forms and stuff, so. Keeping it fresh. Yep. yep. Great. Well, so, thank you so much. It was well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for doing such a good job. And I'm sure our paths will cross David and Diane and you guys have a wonderful day. Is that UNF in the background? What school is that in the background, David? Of I'm sorry, uh, that's Florida International University. Oh, okay. That's where I teach. <laughs> All right, all right. Well, thanks again, right. guys. Well, thank you on behalf of Florida it, uh, yeah, absolutely. Artist Anytime. Group. Thank you for joining us for Landscape Painting by Paul Latnier, Professor Emeritus of Painting and Drawing at University of North Florida. We hope you have enjoyed this live presentation. A link to the video recording of this presentation will be sent to you in the next few days. And at the end of this session, a short, a short survey will be sent to you as well. I hope you will reply. Some programs might still have openings so review our roster events and register by visiting www.floridaartistsgroup.org. So thank you and you all have a good rest of the day. Thank, thank you, David. Wonderful thank, demo. You thank you, Paul. You're welcome, I enjoyed it.